Alrighty, folks, we are in the final stretch of Hollywood Babylon 2 by Kenneth Enger. I'm going to read the remaining chapters because they are admittedly not lengthy. Two of them are picture chapters as well. So we're going to finish out what we have left, chapters 20 to 24, and then we will be finished. Thank you for sticking with me this far. Chapter 20 is called Indiscreet, which shows mostly a variety of photos. Um, if you get your own copy of the book, you will appreciate those. You can look up photos of <clears throat> photos of Jane's Man, Jane Mansfield and uh, uh, cutouts of Hollywood uh, scandalous affairs. Chapter 21, Hollywood Hospital. I'll go nutty in here, shut in with all these nuts. This was Marilyn Monroe's desperate scribbled letter from the Terminus Station, the Nut House. Her mother had got off at the same station, ending her days at a loony bin. For Marilyn, it was the snake pit, the warehouse of the damned. Marilyn was sick, emotionally, but the, men the Menninger Clinic in Kansas City was not the place to dump her. Her plea to Lee Strasberg went unanswered. The great dramatic teacher had no authority to spring her from doctor care. Mental illness in Hollywood. Aren't they all nuts? Did I hear someone say that? No, some have managed very well, thank you. Crazy Bob Hope bought acres and acres of empty desert around the tiny village of Palm Springs with his first big movie and radio bucks back in the 30s. Crazy like a fox. Hope and Crosby were rivals for grabbing up cheap acres back when they were cheap acres. Drive through San Fernando Valley from one end to the other. You have entered what used to be Derbingle land. You have cruised through mile after tracked, home, boring, smoggy mile of Bob Hope land. They used to grow walnuts there. Some haven't managed so well. Some lost their minds. Senile dementia has claimed love goddess Rita Hayworth. At least we know it's Alzheimer's. Rita now wears diapers and has to be spoon-fed. Lucky for Rita, she has a devoted daughter. Senile dementia has claimed Bea Lilly, who at least it's near the age we expect things to go wrong. At her last appearance at MoMA, she was led to the stage of Titus Auditorium, where she proceeded to open her blouse before the fascinated audience of film aficionados, flipping out two pendulous and very weary dugs. A cloud of MoMA curators quickly settled in around her and led her away to her high vocal protests. Hell, the star of On Approval was having a whacking good time. Jean Tierney. She had enough reason to break down poor dear. A retarded child is a heavy number to live with, day after day. George Zucco. This wonderful character actor, the perfect high priest of satanic Atlantis, he of the disturbing glassy eyes and quick disconcerting gestures and cat purr voice, ended his days in the lunatic asylum after he began believing he was crazed villains, or he was the crazed villains monogram and PRC kept paying him to play. The high priest of Mu or Egypt or, Egypt or Atlantis was led away by the fellows in the white coats, dressed to the nines and borrowed monogram boogeyman finery. George's faithful wife and daughter moved into the asylum with him, hoping that their presence would restore his grasp on reality. Quite the contrary, George Zucco slipped away in the Atlantic fog banks finally one midnight dreary, working himself into a paroxysm of fear and loathing, screaming he was being stalked by the great god Cthulhu. George Zucco died in the madhouse from fright. The following midnight, Mrs. Zucco and daughter, unable to live without their meal ticket, unable to face life in Tinseltown without George, joined him in death. Call him the easeful angel. Prince Sirki called. There are a lot of photos in this remaining chapter, and then the next one is another specific picture chapter called The Purple Princess, um, where I believe they are talking about Liz Taylor, as well as Eliza Minnelli, and a variety of other people. And then finally, we get to chapter 23, Hollywood Drugstore. The new wave of dope in Hollywood got off to a good start when Mrs. Woody Allen, Louise Lasser, remember Mary Hartman? Got confused, sat down on the carpeted floor of the posh Twee Rodeo Drive boutique, and began rummaging in her seemingly bottomless purse for something she just had to find, strewing, uh, strewing women's tidbits, hygiene, and vanity items, and crumpled trash all over the thick rug around her. Circle of chaos. Persistence pays, though. Indomitable Louise found the lump of tinfoil she was looking for. Old gum with her favorite flavor, perhaps? And she was proceeding to toke when the Beverly Hills cops, called by a freaked-out boutique owner who should have known better, <laughs> arrived and escorted her away. And there you had Mary Hartman and her braids, America's electronic tracked home heroine, on the front pages of papers all over the land with variations on the headline. Mary Hartman busted for cocaine. It's a matter of police record. 
stashed away in the Spanish police headquarters of our richest town, Beverly Hills. Thus, since it's a matter of record, I am permitted to write about it by the legal mavens of my own front office men. What? Free me to write anything I want? On bathroom walls at Studio 54, maybe? Kenneth Anger, you did way more than that. Barbara Lamar kept her coke in a silver salver on the grand piano. They not only had faces then, they had a touch of taste and style. Our icons we deserve, for we have made them. Where's the style in Richard Dreyfus driving coke stoned into a palm tree? Where's the style in Robert Evans's escape hatch Mia Culpa and so-called warning to youth on a movie he was supposed to make on the judge's orders on the perils of fooling around with drugs? Did high-stakes riverboat gambler Evans need his own little documentary drummed an anti-drug message? Or is it, as gossip has it about Cotton Club, a case of hair of the dog? Now Francis Coppola only has to worry about his addiction to food, the Liz Taylor syndrome. Francis's manic spending Spree's legend in the days of apocalypse have been smoothed down with daily doses of lithium, a drug to be sure, a deadly poison in the wrong hands, or in the wrong dose, but the mind doctors and shrink quacks think they found the answer to the big MD. That's manic depressive, anyone? Liz Taylor's latest health spa check-in was not so much to knock off some pounds, though after they laughed at her in private lives, the joke went, like trying to squeeze ten pounds of shit in a five-pound bag. But to try to get a handle on the rainbow coalition of pills she was dropping every night and day. Pillhead Liz, would you believe? And the health spa clinic made her sign up for S&M Psychodrama 1, a wacko holly weird therapy involving floor scrubbing a la Joan Crawford, expiating guilt, cleaning, dusting, and yes, carrying out the garbage, and her with that fused disc in her back. Why even, the es why even the exorcist girl, the Blair girl, got busted with traces of white powder in her purse while well, it, it was white nose powder and heroin of a certain shootout? Johnny, uh, Jody Foster forgot to hide a gram of powder in her purse as she passed through customs at Boston's Logan Airport. Talk about laid back. Why even 50-ish psychic, a psycho one and two himself, ever gaunt, closeted, and neurotic Tony Perkins, the shrink blamed it all on Papa Osgood, got caught in another bit of slapstick airport business with a supply of sensimilla and three microdots of LSD. Now that's nostalgia, if not entertainment. Do you remember LSD? In his purse as he concorded into London. The difference between dope now and dope then in the Hollywood scene is that it's all gone democratic. I mean, everyone, the gophers, the gaffers, the special effects makers, the guys developing the footage in the labs, is toking away like mad, and it all shows on the screen. Mistakes have happened. Stunts have gone wildly wrong. Stunt girls have been paralyzed. Helicopters have dropped dead weight out of the sky, beheading actors, and it wasn't in the script, in spite of Hollywood's current wallow in gore splatter. Oh, Coke, where is thy sting? Picture a big plate, a big plate of pure cocaine, and I'm talking big bucks here, piled high in a fucking glittering white pyramid, and then picture the sweaty, coarse, pig-faced comedian. Low comedy, very low, going down in that pile till he came up sputtering for air, and white-faced parody of Pierrot. Then go, then the gopher girls, a plenty, play, playboy centerfolds, play, play, playboy centerfolds all, called over by said power-tripping comedian, after all. He paid for it, or he was paid off with it, to lick it all off, his big fat moon face grossed out by john belushi oof cocaine clown on the road to chateau maman it happened to the bar chicago mayor birney granted immunity and a 24-hour stay open permit during the long long location shooting for the blues brothers and to be fair that is a classic now i ask you did you find all those car smash-ups and general lunacy and mayhem all that funny they the folks that gave you that smash em up movie thought it was all very funny a riot at the time too bad they can't get all their audiences high. Speaking of dust storms, remember 1941? Oh boy. Who's surprised that it all had to end that risk-taking, fool-high recklessness and triple tragedy in Twilight Zone? Sooner or later, karma will out. Even Tinseltown's hot new golden boys eventually collect their dues. Well, now they've got coke enders, and the rest of Days USA can always phone 800 cocaine and, well... See if they deliver. The saddest footnote of all was told to me by a high-priced Hollywood hooker who swears she and her big buck sisters will never trick again with certain coke head big names, no matter how much they're offered. <sighs> Excuse me. Better ways to pass the night than hopelessly, uh, hopelessly labor over a flabby phallus fallen and terminal faint. Yes, I'm talking about impotence. It's hit a lot of big names, just like in the last reel of Scarface 2. Yet the arrogance of the guys, free based out of their minds, is that it's up to the chicks to get it up for them. It's no labor of love, and even uh, prosties draw the line. 
Coke cooked limp noodles, thanks, but uh, no thanks. Hail the flaming free base Richard Pryor comet, flashing through the tinsel town night. Scar tissue, anyone? Chapter 24, the final chapter. Death Valley Days. Cut off his legs, quoted by Sam Wood. Hedda and Luella and everyone in Hollywood consider Jane and Ronnie the cutest and nicest and happiest young married couple in town. Their divorce in 1949 set off shock waves of disbelief. Curiously enough, it was the only divorce in history in which two Warner Brothers movies could have been uh, named as co-respondents. In 1948, Reagan had told Hedda Hopper, If this comes to divorce, I think I'll name Johnny Belinda co-respondent. That's my best impression of Ronald Reagan, by the way. Wyman's star was rising higher and higher. His was plummeting. She had an Oscar. He didn't. Wyman won her Academy Award for her superb performance in a deaf, as a deaf mute in Jean Negulesco's 1949, Johnny Belinda. Once when the couple was dining out, the waiter turned to Reagan and asked, And what will Mr. Wyman have? The only sensitive and meaty performance of Reagan's entire film career was as an amputee, Drake McHugh in Sam Wood's 1942 King Row, or King's Row. It was his all-time favorite movie. He inflicted the picture time and again on dinner guests at their house. Wyman remarked, I just couldn't watch that damn King's Row anymore. During the divorce proceedings, she contented herself with testifying that he was too absorbed in politics. Our first couple met cute, significantly, in a political context. Reagan first met the prudish and conservative young actress Nancy Davis when he helped her clear herself of the suspicion of communist affiliations. Her name had turned up on the witch hunters' lists. At that time, Reagan was the liberal president of the Screen Actors Guild. The first date took place when he invited her to dinner and informed her that she had been cleared. It was another Nancy Davis who was listed as commie. They continued dating. The following year, Nancy gave the most uplifting performance of her tiny film career when, as a pregnant housewife in The Next Voice You Hear, she heard the voice of God on the radio. The next logical step was to marry Ronald Reagan. They were wed in 1952. Ronnie is getting mighty fed up on those swell guy roles he's been getting. He wants to play a meanie for a change, quoted by Ruth Roman, Movieland, in April of 1950. Ronnie had been a leftist Democrat during his early career. If he became a Republican, and since he has proven himself the country's most right-wing president since McKinley, the thanks may be in large part due to Nancy. Patricia Neal, who starred with him in three films at Warner's, opined, when I knew Ronnie, he was very liberal, and when I think he was liberal until, well, he met his present wife. Nancy regarded her stepfather, the Chicago surgeon Dr. Loyal Davis, as her real father. This gentleman is said to have been, quote, intolerant of minorities, end quote. When Nancy was in Chicago in 1980 for a campaign fundraiser, she spoke to her husband on an amplified phone hookup and told him, while the assembled press listened, how much she wished she could be there to see all these beautiful white people. Oh, boy. The only premiere I can think of this month was Bedtime for Bonzo at the, Car uh, the Carthay Circle, which was somewhat marred by the accidental death of its chimpanzee star the day before. Quoted by Grace Fisher, Motion Picture, June 1951. Subsequent to his second marriage, Reagan's career was confined to a handful of bee turkeys. In 1954, he began a new career on television. Anne Sheridan says... I remember Ronnie telling all of us not to join TV because it was the enemy of the movies. Next thing, he was on General Electric Theater with his contact lenses reading the commercials. In 1961, he spoke at a fundraiser for the re-election to Congress of John Roussillot of the John Birch Society. In 1962, Reagan became a full-fledged Republican. That same year, he was fired from the General Electric Theater because his off-the-two political speeches were too far to the right, even for that company's comfort. Or comfort. He was, a, he was a silly young kid. Everyone called him Little Ronnie Reagan, quoted by Betty Davis. After his election as governor of California, he promptly fired two of his staff members at Sacramento, uh, Sacramento when he learned that they were gay. Reagan considered homosexuality a tragic illness, which should remain illegal. In the Bible, he told author Robert Shear, it says that in the eyes of the Lord, this is a great abomination. In the eyes of many Californians, his career as governor was an even greater one. When the Reagans set up housekeeping in the White House, they, turning pages, removed the portrait of Harry Truman, replaced it with one of Calvin Coolidge, and affairs of state permitting set about inviting globs of old Hollywood cronydoms to drop in and dine off Nancy's fancy Graustarkian plates. The wise and happy few have included Charlton, 
Moses, Heston, Jimmy Stewart, Gung Ho Tuffy Titty Anti Commie Ginger Rogers, Shirley Temple, and Claudette Cleopatra Colbert, who was said to be among the first to advise the president to invade Grenada. She was far from delighted at the prospect of an island uh, full of reds so near to her palatial Barbados estate. When President Ronnie calls, the old glamour pusses jump. Ex-Democrat Frank Sinatra, Audrey Hepburn, and that evergreen ski nose pillar of reaction, Bob Hope. One pious old star caused a tizzy when her colostomy, bag, or her colostomy can, concealed in the folds of her evening gown, set off security alarms. It's a bit like the last volume of Proust, The Past Recaptured, in which all of the appealing creatures he had previously met in their younger heydays reappear at a party as barely recognizable gargoyles. Reagan is a major concern. I think we're headed for a disaster. I listened to a Reagan speech and I want to throw up. Quoted by Henry Fonda in Playboy, December 1981. Alexis Smith enjoyed the signal, uh, the signal honor of being the, the sole emissary from Tinseltown at an October 1982 White House state dinner in front of President Suharto of Indonesia. Alexis dined on beef bernay and molded pear, or pear sherbet, breaking bread with a statesman whose regime, whose regime, uh, regime good lord, what is going on with me today? whose reg uh, regime established itself by means of the execution of an estimated half million human beings whose death squads have summarily killed over 4,000 inhabitants of his capital in recent months and who was practicing genocide in East Timor. I never worked with Ronald Reagan. I'm not happy that he's president. I was willing to give him a chance, but he's destroying everything now I've lived my life for. Quoted by Myrna Loy on the TV show Legends of the Screen in 1982. The ingratiating star of Swing Your Lady and the Cowboy from Brooklyn has slashed government programs that benefited the poor, depriving thousands of the country's underprivileged children so that we can afford more nuclear bombs, while his cuts in corporate taxation have ensured that his rich supporters will get richer. His anti-environmental stance has made this the most toxic, quote-unquote, administration in America's history. In a 1979 radio speech, Reagan maintained that most air pollution is caused not by chimneys or auto exhaust, but by plants and trees. He has shattered the detente, carefully built up by previous administrations and reinstated Uncle Sam as the world's policeman, using the CIA to foment war, uh, or foment war against Nicaragua, and he instituted an unprecedented stifling of the press during his invasion of Granada. He has insulted vast numbers of loyal citizens by reiterating that the anti-nuclear power movement is communist-inspired. His devil theories on the Soviet Union have put us on a collision course with Russia. In the light of his appalling nuclear policy, the titles of several of his movies t take now on a particularly somber afterglow. Accidents will happen. The Killers, Dark Victory, and Nine Lives Are Not Enough. Hollywood Babylon is moribund, dead, defunct, croaked, crowbait, finito, caput, caputissimo. With Reagan at the helm, we're already watching the tra uh, trailer of the ultimate picture show, Hollywood Armageddon. End of Real 2. Live in Laurel Canyon, where murders are colorful, drug busts are frequent, and helicopters circle overhead at odd hours. Rub elbows with political giants and social outcasts. Live and wonder and experience the unknown. 2BR and 1BA legit, with some hidden rooms rented. How can you lose it? $155,000 even has a garage. Call Gene Dimitrick, 213-654-4769. And folks, that is the end of Hollywood Babylon 2. We are completely done, and that's all I can really say. That last chapter obviously got a little bit topical at the time this book was published. I appreciate you all listening. I appreciate you all sticking with me. I wanted to get this done sooner, and my work schedule got in the way, but I am now completely done with the two most prominent books written by a very, very peculiar individual, but who is no longer with us. Rest in peace, Kenneth Anger. Uh, for those of you who are listening, I really appreciate your help, your loyalty, your support, your recommendations, your clarifications when I didn't pronounce stuff properly, and um, I am just grateful that I was finally able to accomplish this project I set out on. Thank you for listening. If you have any recommendations, I'll be happy to take a look at them for what I'm going to possibly read next. I just, I don't have any idea right now. And with my schedule, I'd like to make sure that I really want to fit something in. So otherwise, I hope you all have a great rest of your lives.